Uh, I'll start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet. Uh, for me, that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, but, you know, coming from you all around Australia, it'd be um, different traditional owners around the place. And, um, you know, wanting to pay our respects to the elders, past, present and future. Um, so welcome. This is going to be a panel discussion tonight. We're going to start with a chat with the panel, uh, go into a bit of audience Q&A at the end where we'll, you know, if you have a question and you're willing to turn on your camera and your microphone, we'll invite you onto the panel so that you can ask your question. Um, and for the last 30 minutes or so, we'll do a bit of um, networking where, depending on how many people we have, we'll either do breakout rooms into um, Google Hangouts or we'll just invite everyone up onto the panel and just have a big group discussion there. Um, so in my top left, we have um, from FutureAmp, Madeline Grummet and Edwina Kolomansky. So FutureAmp is an interactive career education platform for young people. It features future skills, micro credentials, industry backed virtual work experience and a video library with hundreds of career mentors. So students can get inside the real world of work and have an experience for what it's like. Uh, Madeline and Edwina are also founders of Girlworld, World, a nationally recognized award winning career education company, which to date has worked with more than 180 schools and more than 30,000 high school students to upskill them for the future of work. Um, welcome, Madeline and Edwina, or as we know them, Madwina. <laughs> Great to be here, Pete. Thanks for having us. <laughs> uh, my bottom left, we have Scott Miller, CEO and founder of Bob Industries. Bop Industries is a technology and education company on a mission to inspire the next generation of digital creators. By helping bring entrepreneurship, innovation and steam into the classroom, the Bop team are working to help inspire and empower Generation Z as they prepare for the ever-changing future of work. Um, entrepreneur in residence at Griffith University, Scott started his entrepreneurial journey with a year nine business project that he built into a rapidly growing company. Welcome, Scott. Thanks so much for having me. Very excited to be here. Uh, Scott always uh, brings a smile to our faces whenever he joins a Zoom call with his big, uh, bright smile and wave. <laughs> and uh, my bottom right, Petra Trinke, Head of Learning Area of Hampton Senior High School. Um, Hampton is an independent public school in Perth, Western Australia, with a school motto of Labor Omnia Vincit, hard work conquers all, and a vision to aspire, innovate, and achieve. Petra is an award-winning educator of computer science, STEM, and digital technologies, vice president of the Educational Computing Association of Western Australia, a Microsoft innovation education expert and an Adobe education leader, and a member of our Future Minds Advisory Council chaired by David Gonski. Welcome, Petra. Welcome. Welcome from the West. Welcome from the <laughs> West. So um, the topic tonight is bringing schools and industry together. And uh, I thought I'd start, you know, going around the panel, we'll start with some examples of how have you brought schools and industry together um, in the work that you've been doing. So I might start um, with FutureAmp with um, Mads and Edwina. Yeah. So thanks, Pete, um, and welcome everybody. Great to see so many people from around Australia joining us and we're keen to chat to you at, uh, after the panel discussion. Um, so as Pete mentioned, we've been working together for around about four years now with students right across Australia. And um, our mission really has always been to connect um, education with Industry 4.0, understanding where is industry going, what are the requisite skills, and how do we start to get students more connected with the real world. Um, we've done that in a number of ways. We've done large scale events where we've actually had industry speakers come and connect with students. Uh, we've also done work mentoring, so where students are placed inside industry and almost shadow people that they're looking at whole, you can't be what you can't see. So really connect students with the lived experience of being inside a job or industry. So they can start to connect on a personal level with what lights them up around that job. Um, and now of course with FutureAmp, which is an ed tech platform, uh, we're enabling students from anywhere to go inside workplace and workplaces and experience it virtually. So that connection can happen with a student in Dubbo, can do work experience inside a metro city, um, really uh, broadening that frame of reference and the tyranny of distance or some of the demographic barriers that we can see with students, which hold them back. Um, we're really trying to bridge that gap. So there's this really open line where this bridge between education students and industry and the people who want to try and reach their future talent pipeline. 
And when you say industry, are you able to, are you allowed to name any kind of the companies or particular um, workplaces you work with? Absolutely. So um, certainly um, we've had a keen interest in the STEM sort of sector and technology sector. So companies including Microsoft, um, Atlassian, um, CultureAmp, Airbnb. Um, so it's some of the really front of wave kind of companies. And then of course we come into um, you know, the middle market or, or corporate sector and also startups because of course we know that entrepreneurship and startups are a really big feature of the new economy. We need innovators and we need people with entrepreneurial skills and so a lot of the companies we also connect with are across that ecosystem. So it's, it's very important to us that um, not everyone's the same and what we need to do is help students to work out what lights them up, what is their interest area and how do they cultivate a skill set that they can transfer across those industries that are both emerging and then also the, those industries that we know Dan Tien has re recently said that will be the backbone of Australia's new economy during a complex time uh, for us with COVID. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. And Scott, speaking of young entrepreneurs, um, what are some examples of um, how you've brought industry and schools together? Yeah, great question. Um, so I guess for us, like where the interest really started was for me, like starting my business in year nine, I was found myself through high school, like running a tech business whilst also studying technology and business. And I found there was a really big disconnect between what was actually happening in the industry and what was happening in the classroom. Um, after graduating, we started getting out there um, working with a lot of students and we had a number of um, different organizations approach us saying, we want to get in touch with students, but we just don't know how, like, like the education system, it's so strange, we don't know how to get into it. And we're like, well, we've got this awesome network of schools that are always looking at how we can make education, like we always talk about the three R's of education being real, relevant and relatable. Um, schools and teachers looking for that and we had all these corporate partners looking at how they could do that so for us um, it's typically through a lot of our innovation camps they started with our school holiday programs about 18 months ago um, where we were able to bring students um, into these different industry partners head offices and show them the different career pathways they didn't know they could have inside these organizations. Um, we bring them into the Virgin offices and say to them, like, what sort of roles do you think there are inside an airline? And you hear the kids say, pilot, flight attendant, ground crew. But then you bring down the revenue management team, you bring across the product team, the operations team, the customer service team, and show them all these different career pathways they didn't know they could have. Um, and I think what really excites me about it is the learning for the students is just amazing, getting to build that connection with those brands to see the amazing opportunities inside these organisations. But I think as well, being able to show this um, organisations the power of young people. I always say that Generation Z, the digital natives, we've grown up in a world unlike anything that we've ever seen before. Like for me, Wi-Fi hit the mainstream when I was in primary school. The first iPhone came out when I was in year two and Facebook hit a billion monthly active users before I was old enough to get Facebook. So like our generation, we think about the world so differently. We solve challenges so differently. And we find for our corporate partners, when they pitch challenges that they're really facing, for our students. Um, our students have got some really out of the box solutions for them. And within those out of the box solutions, there are some real nuggets of gold. Um, like I think one of my favorite examples was a couple of months ago, we were running a program um, with Virgin Australia and we had these two 12 year old girls that had figured out how to fly a Boeing 777 on nothing but renewable energies. And we had Paul Scar, the CEO, he comes down and hangs out with our kids every program. Um, and he was sitting there listening to them and these two 12 year old girls got up. I've never seen more confidence in my life. And they just got up and they were like talking about how they put solar panels in the window shades, they'd feather the engines, trying on kinetic energy, all this sort of stuff. And they finished their pitch and they just like brushed their hands off and they're like, uh, so Paul, um, we're 12 years old and we figure this out. Fire your engineering department, hire us and we'll make you a millionaire. Um, and it was just great being able to see the confidence of these students, but showing them how they can think outside of the box. And the awesome thing is we've seen from a bunch of our corporate partners, um, they're actually implementing the ideas our students are coming up with, which has just been absolutely amazing. Yeah, that must be hugely rewarding for, for yourself, but also for the students, like seeing people from the industry go, wow, that's an amazing idea. Let's give that a go. And I think that's the thing is like being able to, for the students to know that their ideas are going out for like beyond the classroom, um, not just pitching for the sake of pitching, but knowing that the ideas they're coming up with are actually going to be fed back to their industry partners and they're going to be getting the feedback from the industry. Um, I think that's really rewarding for the students, not just doing it for the sake of it, but doing it to really make a difference. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. Scott, Scott, just building on what you're saying, and it also enables a two-way conversation. So it's not to push down into pipeline or, or pushing up, but it's really saying, 
you know, connecting the generations and the diversity that the workforce is really requiring now to solve some of the complex challenges. Um, it's, it's exactly what we need, companies like yours and certainly our working girl world with design thinking challenges, same thing. Bring it in, get young people to think about it because they're the ones who will inherit that problem uh, and take that, that solution into the world that will be theirs. And I think it taps into that whole idea of reverse mentoring as well, which says that young people, we've got so much more, so much we can learn from more experienced people in the field. But I think the learning goes both ways that there's more experienced people that have been in the industry for 20, 30, 40 years have got so much they can learn from this fresh set of eyes and this new generation. It's a really exciting time, I think. And the fact that you guys can share that information online and with your with community um, is really important because not everyone gets the opportunity and the chance to do that either out of school um, or in school as well. So the fact that you're providing um, opportunities, opportunities like this is absolutely fantastic. And it's really what we need in this, in this time, especially for the future jobs out there. Oh, thank you. And I think a lot of it as well is like making those connections where from a corporate perspective, they're like, we want to work with schools, but we don't know how to. And we also don't have the capacity to deal with 500 teachers approaching us. And at the same time, these teachers that are in the classroom saying, we just don't have time to go out and connect with all these big organizations, having companies like FutureAmp and also BOP as well, that can be that bridge and that middleman saying, we'll take all of this content from our corporate partners, package it up into a way that's engaging and exciting for kids, but also to aligns with curriculum and deliver it to the teachers in the classroom. Um, I think it's, it's a really nice way to make sure that that everything we're teaching is real, it's relevant, and it's relatable, especially as the future of work is changing so quickly. Absolutely. And it's just that ever-evolving landscape. Um, there's a lot of teachers out there that just don't have the time or resources to um, invest in this type of approach of learning and, and innovative solutions um, to solve problems. So um, it's really great that you guys can actually get out there um, and share that experience with students. Absolutely. I think that's it with, say, technology, that's where we can be really creative. I mean, we started when we were born of a business that was a service, an event-based business where we were getting out um, and bringing people together in the real. And I think that the, the time in which we're living at the moment is such a great example of the fact that using technology and being smart and thinking about how we can really open access to lots of people through the power of technology and collaboration um, it's really exciting and I think it's also challenging all of us to think about how we can collaborate, share and provide opportunities for all young people um, but like never before. And I think that's the thing is like we're not geographically bound anymore. Like if you're a teacher and you're teaching like a science class, there's no reason that you can't jump on a Zoom call or a Microsoft Teams call with an actual scientist in Germany or in Melbourne or in America or anywhere around the world. And I think it's showing the kids that like hearing it from the people that are doing it themselves, where those kids can look at a real scientist or a real person in the industry and say, wow, like I want to be like you. We always talk about those ideas of like micro influences where it's like you show kids Richard Branson and Elon Musk and all that, and they're great, but they're almost like unattainable goals. But if you show them someone that's 10, 20 years older than they are, they can look at that and go, wow, if I work really hard for the next 10, 15 years, I can be where you are. It's like breaking it down into those bite-sized chunks, but making it more achievable to the kids instead of those big, um, yeah, those big audacious goals. Yeah, and students actually need to be able to be quite driven in an environment like that, um, especially when the onus goes back onto them. Um, the fact that, you know, they might be in a situation where they're just in front of a computer, yet they have to reach some targets and some goals like for their business. And we're not actually teaching those types of skills in class. Um, so it's really interesting how... Um, programs like this can actually change the way in which they approach and their soft skills um, that's going to be embedded to them. Absolutely. And like Mads and Edwina, how do you guys find on the flip side, like what's the response you're seeing from a lot of those mentors and the corporate partners, like as they're actually having these conversations with the kids and the shadowing and the work experience opportunities, like, is it a similar sort of experience? Yeah, I think it's definitely a really invigorating experience. And you mentioned the, the phrase that I was just about to say again about that reverse mentorship and the power of just connecting people and, and bringing youth voice into corporates or into government or into real world problems. Young people just, we, I think we underrate them a lot of the time and dismiss their point of view when, um, as Mads mentioned earlier, I think that these are the people that are going to be inheriting 
problems or are going to be impacted by a lot of the really um, large scale decisions that are being made in boardrooms across, across the country now. So young people have a lot of really amazing things to say and contribute to the conversation. So um, it, people who inside boardrooms, I think are, are becoming more open to welcoming that youth voice into uh, and, and providing other channels and opportunities for young people to be involved in the kind of corporate community. Uh, I think also something that's kind of been ticking around in my head in this conversation so far is yes, there's it, there's impact for young people and for cor um, corporations and government to an extent, and also teachers. But I think that it's also beneficial for parents as well too, because providing young people with access into the real world, we know from lots of work with particularly regional or low SES um, schools and cohorts of students, is it takes a lot of the pressure off from parents from having to be the front of all knowledge and from the parents being the gatekeepers to kind of what's possible for their, um, for their children. And I think providing parents with as much support as we can at the moment is really important. And the kind of bridging of education and industry and providing um, students with access points that they might, may not have otherwise is also really important. So making sure that we're thinking of parents as well, who I'm sure a lot of parents at the moment are really struggling. Yeah. Petra, what are you finding from a teacher's perspective? Like, are they um, wanting to, like, from a teacher's perspective, like, reaching out and trying to get more industry into the classroom? Like, what what do teachers feel? Like, how do they feel about reaching out to industry? Like, what's the vibe? Look, honestly, I think they're really open to it. Um, but unfortunately, there's just, there may be, like, too many hoops to jump through to uh, see how it aligns to, you know, the curriculum. Also, uh, what other extracurricular activities are going on in the school, even um, what what's the whole purpose of it? So it, does it become a whole school uh, focus? Um, is innovation or entrepreneurialism a, a key focus in particular schools? Um, and a lot of that is sort of driven, you know, through the executive team. Um, so therefore, you know, the dynamics of what each, and each individual school has to offer um, is really, you know, from that top uh, tier and, and driven down. So um, in my context, it is ICT specialist. Um, I have no, uh, I really don't have any limits as to what I can do in that space. Um, but if you have an, an academically driven school, then, you know, it becomes a numbers game. So, you know, what's the buy-in? for that school to um, have you guys come in or have anyone um, industry on board and start to do some programs with the kids. So um, I was just in the, in, the, um, in the moment of answering a question from Eddie, who's talking about the traditional workplace and whether it still adds value. So um, workplace learning uh, is, still, is still a thing. I'm not too sure what that actually looks like in the Eastern states, especially now because of COVID and students actually missing out on those engaging activities. Um, but I really feel that you can't replace that experience of being in a workplace. Um, and I think it, it really gives students the opportunities to choose whether or not something is well suited for them, especially now that we're in that um, sort of age that you know computing is around us, technology um, is kind of embedded all around us and, you know, say for example, cyber security, um, there's a massive push for industry and jobs um, to go through the cyber security pathway. But students, we don't actually, we may not have the facilities to run that and we do um, do a lot of partnerships with the universities around that space. So students are exposed to that. However, um, you know, that is a, an economical driver um, and I don't really think that students know what it entails, um, you know, in that, in that space, um, especially when it gets to the programming um, and, and other things around that. So definitely um, having some sort of workplace experience um, is really, really beneficial for the kids. I do think work experience though does have a way to go. Like I remember, so I did my work experience about 
four years ago. Um, and even then, like I was fortunate enough that I went and did my work experience with a local co-working space when I was in grade 10. Um, and it was great, like being a co-working space, it was very much that startup mentality where I remember as a 15 year old, they were like, here's like a startup needs this marketing campaign. Can you build that for them? And then can you run this event for them? And it was this, that and everything. So it was great. But I know so many of my friends, even still in like 2016, they found themselves sitting just like sweeping the floors or watching people do stuff and it was just so boring and like disengaging for them and if anything it turned them off like I don't I don't think I had any friends that came back from work experience excited they were like that was a week of my life and never gonna get back that was so boring and I think the frustrating thing is quite often that's not actually what it's like for industries it's just that businesses get work experience students they say okay you just sit in a corner don't talk don't touch anything just be there it's almost like they're a burden I think we need to find better ways to expose students to the workplace but also get them excited about their workplace show them the awesome opportunities rather than see them as a burden yeah totally um Scott one of the ways we've tried to solve for that which is not satisfactory for the industry or the student is we've done a lot of work with both students and industry to understand what awesome looks like and for the student awesome looks like them us starting with not what do you want to be when you grow up but what's the problem you want to solve in the world and then getting them to work off that to then work out, okay, which pathway or which job or which company will we put you inside so you can get some lived experience? And for the company, getting the student to do some practical tasks, either in a real world placement, so real world learning happens in the real world, or if that can't be done, because some students can't, because of the demographic or sociographic situation or geographic situation. And so, what does virtual work experience look like? So one of the big um, you know, innovations we've developed in FutureRamp is we've worked with lots of industries to develop work experience modules that are virtual. So it means that, that a student can go and try something and immerse in that, in that world virtually and still get that experience. Now, I agree that in the real is powerful. Human to human learning will never be replaced. Um, but this does bridge that tyranny of dif difference and it also opens frame of reference because of course we know most students to get work experience, it's just, who might be in your community. It's just who you know. And that's for a high potential kid, um, you know, who maybe mum and dad didn't finish school or there's no one in their community who's in a job that might be cyber security or an emerging industry. We need to ensure they can bridge into that potential. Um, and I think technology enables that and virtual experiences enable that. And I think being very practical about this because like, we need to be practical and think about how we can implement things that are actually going to work for people for industries that we've worked with, instead of having 50 students that are going, um, work experience students that are going into their business every year, and yes, they might have a process or a way of doing it, the time involved in that is immense. So I think, and they, the student that Scott, as you just mentioned, it might be a student that goes into the workplace and ends up sweeping the floor or making coffee or photocopying, whatever it might be. But for us, thinking about how we can be very efficient in the way that we can provide the best experience for a student, by using the resources inside it in, inside an organization as best as we can through our kind of virtual work experience program is saying to the organization yes putting together this program might take three days working time for x number of employees and that's all you need to do so we're very clear on what the expectation is from the industry partner so it's not becoming a burden they can really see the value of the time they're investing mm -hmm. into the program and it's something that's evergreen. It's content that will not disappear after a week, a month. It's content that lasts for a, long, a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. And also for a student, that's also beneficial for a school and for a student, but for the fact that they've got access to that awesome content and they, everybody gets to feed off those three amazing days yeah. that we've spent working with an organisation to develop the virtual work experience yeah. program. It's a one-to-many model with a one-to-one -one outcome uh, for the student. And what are you guys finding as well? Like you mentioned some of those tech companies you're working with. Like it's fascinating. I've been doing some research recently into just like, as you mentioned, Generation Z being so so motivated to try and make a difference in the world. Like I read, a, I think it was a Deloitte report that said young people, young professionals under the age of 30 are willing to take up to a 33% pay cut to work for a company or a cause that they truly believe in, which is great for a lot of these new companies that really are forward thinking and are looking at how are we supporting our local community, but not as great for our like EYs, our Deloitte's, our KPMGs that are those traditional service firms that are like have the big salaries, but aren't really doing any social good. Like I've, have you guys had many conversations with like those very traditional organizations and what are their thoughts on changing up work experience and how they're doing it? Yeah, I think it's interesting. If I can start with thinking about the kind of forward facing and emerging industry companies, like I think about like say the slacks of the world, they really understand 
what the future of work is going to look like because the future of work already exists for them. They're living and breathing it every day. And they understand the importance of mission and purpose and values and creating an awesome working environment for people because talent is scarce in some parts of the world, particularly or some, some parts of the company, country and particular skill sets, particularly emerging skill sets like STEM skill sets are really in really high demand. So it's, it's hot competition for attracting great talent. So for them, it's a really easy conversa conversation about work experience and getting people um, and virtual work experience because they know that they need to start building their talent pipeline. So for them, it's a really easy conversation. For more traditional um, industries, everybody's got FOMO, like everybody's constantly trying to kind of keep up with the Joneses. So, and I don't want to be disrespectful to traditional industries or employers because they are, they're um, steadfast, they don't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon and they also do important work. So, and they also employ a lot of people and it is a career pathway for people. So our conversations and work with traditional employers, it is a bit of a different conversation to kind of the, the um, forward, forward and front facing organisations. But having said that, existing organisations, they still want to do the best that they can. And there are still really valuable insights that students can like experiences uh, that students can glean from um, opportunities with traditional industries. I'm not sure if that answered your question properly, Scott. No, um, that was perfect. I think it's, yeah, it's interesting. And especially as well when it comes down to the kind of work kids are doing. Like we've been doing a couple of projects recently with a few of our schools around like 21st century skills mapping. So in Queensland and most states have got a similar thing where we talk about the 21st century skills. Um, in Queensland in particular, they've said that every student graduating year 12 should be an entrepreneur, an innovator, a responsible global citizen and a lifelong learner. And a lot of schools and industries are like, we're doing it but are we doing it? Um, and one of the things we found is it's a massive, like it's almost like a blame game where it's like the tech teachers are standing there pointing at the business teachers and the business teachers are pointing at the English teachers and the English teachers are pointing at the, like the Haas teachers. But it's kind of like, it's tricky to figure out who should actually be connecting with industry, who's looking after these 21st century skills. Um, and maybe the answer to that, Scott, is everybody should be. Because what we know and we see for it coming pardon me, from a federal level, you know, at, at every level of government, we see it and we see in inside industry, they're looking back into pipeline saying, how can we cultivate a talent pipeline of people who do have transferable skills? I mean, we're in the 21st century. Um, you know, I think, you know, we, we, the words change a lot. We're soft skills and then we move to enterprise skills, employability skills, transferable skills. We're talking about skills that people can bring into the workforce so they can remain employed. And, and so these are fundamental skills. And in fact, students are cultivating them already and teachers are doing a great job at, at cultivating skills like problem solving, teamwork, critical thinking. Look at curriculum design now. It's dynamic and it's, it's phenomenal. All we need to do is extract that. Let's understand how we actually start to measure those skills so that as students move through the schooling system, we can, at the end of that time, not just pull an ATAR, but actually say this person has amazing EQ or their critical thinking was exemplified through this project or this experience, like in one of your programs. So I think what we need to do is change the conversation around it being some nice to have or external kind of offsite. And actually the skills need to sit right across the curriculum at every subject. They need to be deeply laid into the sediment of, of that school experience so that students can then bring those out and they're, they're ready to play with the tools. I'm gonna have to throw to Petra on this one. <laughs> To get the, uh, to get the chalk talk. face, yeah. Um, yes, no, I do, because I'm, I'm sort of sitting here, like, I think that just really opens up um, the importance of micro-credentials um, and how we can implement that into schools. Um, because, you know what, there, there is su still such a focus on numeracy and literacy. Um, and then also it becomes a numbers game. So, you know, how schools are performing um, about their ATAR, but, you know, what does really happen to those other kids that aren't bound for that particular pathway? Um, how can we open up the landscape so that everyone has an opportunity to become entrepreneurs or, um, you know, or startups? You know, we, we don't actually teach kids in school how to think critically in this space. So um, how can we challenge them and, um, and get them really motivated to feel, um, to really feel that, you know, they can take to whatever challenge that comes their way, you know? Um, and, and that's actually really difficult. It's, it's quite difficult in a classroom setting. Um, we only see them for an hour 
where, you know, which is our period, um, either that be, you know, two periods a week or four periods a week, depending on what um, class you've got. Um, and then of course, we're up against the, the time frame that we've got. So um, I think I'm gonna say nicely though, that um, COVID has had a positive imp impact on, um, on the landscape of schools and remote learning and how we can all um, really start to engage with students um, in that online space, because I think there, there was so, there was a little bit of fear mongering around that, you know, um, being a professional and then, you know, it, what, uh, what applications are you starting to communicate with students? Is it okay? Do, does, you know, the governing bodies like the education department allow it? Um, have, you know, I had a, a group of competition students that I had a Slack channel with. Um, and everything's documented, you know, if anyone wants to challenge me on, on it, well, here, here you go, there it is. So, um, but yeah, just really getting, um, getting these kids to think of all these other stuff that we don't actually get a chance to do. In and Petra, congratulations to you, because you're obviously, I mean, you are, we've connected before through um, Future Minds and you're a progressive educator and that you are harnessing, you know, the best parts of technology to enable learning to happen, not just because it's shiny and new, but because it's actually the best tool to enable that learning. And one of the things I'm picking up on and I'm hearing from you and we've seen through COVID and maybe it's a silver lining for all the devastation that's occurring is that we are seeing truly differentiated learning for those who are lucky enough to have digital tools to learn on, caveat. Um, we're seeing also asynchronous learning where it might suit the student better actually to not be in a mass education setting where their learning is going to happen better at a self-paced level and technology enables that and the flexibility that we're seeing in curriculum enables that in, in best practice. And so um, I think it's important that we, that we understand that and that hopefully over the curve, whenever that happens for us all, um, we can start to take some of the best and leave some of the things behind that really weren't serving us and that were calcified versions of an industrial education system um, that, that needs to start to snap to fit the requirements of, of the modern workforce. And that's partly about micro-credentialing credentialing, and it's partly also about what are we measuring? Are we measuring your maths capability? Or are we measuring how you did perform in that team? And, and one of the, um, the fundamentals inside our platform is a career passport. And we know Peter Shergold and others have spoken about this. And the career passport ultimately is saying you can get some stamps in there for the things you're doing that cannot be measured by a traditional uh, curriculum because we need to start to acknowledge and badge uh, and reward those students who have some incredible skills that sit outside of that. Um, and certainly if we look to the Indigenous population, there are so many phenomenal skills that are, that are built, that are life skills, that are cultural skills. We've got to start to acknowledge that and bring a whole person into the centre of their pathway. And I think that's the exciting thing, like when that actually starts to translate and they can export those skills into a resume. Like I was doing a program um, with a school just last week and we were talking about, it was around the future of work. And one of the, the sessions was like designing a resume for like one of the hundred jobs of the future. Um, for those of you that haven't seen it, there's a hundred jobs of the future report done by Griffith, Deacon and Ford that is outstanding. Um, we're getting kids to design their resumes. And it was interesting because we were talking about like, how, how do you, like how, what sort of stuff should you put on a resume? And one of the sample resumes we had where was where an applicant had listed their skills and it was almost like a progress bar on like their top five skills and where they thought they were on their progress. Um, and it was interesting because like the careers count, like the careers teacher that was very, very traditional um, called me up before we delivered this program when I showed them the content and she was like, I think I fundamentally, like fundamentally, fundamentally disagree with this because resumes should be black and white. They should be just stating your experience and this sort of stuff is just, it's garbage. But I think what really excites me is showing students a way they can tangibly communicate the skills that they're building that aren't necessarily, I got a, like, I got straight A's or a gold academic award or a um, award for this competition. It's, I'm building these skills in my career experience. I'm building these skills, my soft skills as well, and being able to put that on a resume for an employer to see. I think even um, for students that are starting their own um, life journey in, in work is that, you know, the, there's so many resources online and so they look towards these resource templates, but, you know, how do they actually uh, review their own soft skills? You know, 
yes, they might have done a little bit of word processing, but, you know, how does that transpire into the real workplace when they can apply those skills? Um, and really, what are they, is an employer going to look at that resume and go, okay, well, you know, you've got this, so what can you do with it? Um, and, and, I, and I think, um, you know, when there's limited jobs out there, um, what is that standout for students? And, and if there are some transferable skills that they can definitely see, um, then, you know, they may get those opportunities which they probably would have been overlooked. And I think it's one thing I always ask my, I, I always say to my students, but it's one thing I always ask whenever we hire new employees is the question, why aren't you boring? And it's a funny one because it throws so <laughs> many people off. They're like, Oh, maybe I am boring. But I always say to students, like when you graduate year 12, you graduate with the exact same set of skills as about 100,000 other students across the country. You've got to think about what's going to make you stand out. And like, that's where extracurriculars are such a great way to bring that in. That's where work experience, internships, and just something to set you aside. Because like, I know for us, we have a lot of our facilitators are those, those uni students. They're in their first couple of years of uni. And that's like, I look at their resumes and it looks like you've just photocopied the same resume about a hundred times because there's nothing really different about any of them. But it's always the thing that I look for is what sets one student apart from another. And it's those extracurriculars, work experience and internships. It's reasons they're not boring. And I think that's what students should be looking for as soon as they get into high school is ways they can differentiate themselves. Yeah, I think that Scott's at such a great point as well. Like, I think the way that we structure kind of school and high school and then uh, institutional learning, whether that's through a VET pathway or through a university or into workplaces, is that we're a classic silo system where the right hand doesn't really talk to the left hand. So I think a lot of it is us challenging how can we blur the lines between school and industry so that it isn't such a shock to a system when a year 12 student or a year 10 student who's leaving the school system suddenly is granted with it, welcomed into this whole new world. They have no context. They can't articulate their skill set. We haven't been preparing them well enough for this transition. And I think this is where work, like the con concept of work integrated learning and talking about skills and employability skills being part of the DNA of the education in a, a high school is so important because uh, at the moment otherwise it's kind of like you, you finish school and then there's this kind of big abyss and then we're forcing kids to kind of make this big leap into work, the workplace where I kind of I don't come from an education background but being immersed in this space for the last four years is and and like kind of, kind of questioning like why do we have a system the way it is and we know that the system constrains so much of what we do but there are so many more opportunities for us now and like I love hearing um, the programs that Bob are running um, Scott about constantly challenging and thinking about how do we blur these lines between school and work and learning because at the end of the day where we should be cultivating students to be lifelong learners that they're constantly learning it doesn't stop when you finish school yeah and maybe we ask the students it's about co-design it's about putting the answers partly in the hands of the students and and also it is a top down with what at a policy level needs to shift we see recent reports about industry and workforce requirements especially We've had an economic black swan event with COVID. And so we need to, we know that skills are fast becoming the currency of the new labour market. We can see that with market activity. We need to start to connect employers and workers and students and policymakers and actually redesign the system. And then we'll start to see some difference around the mandate of, of what is it we're measuring? What are we pulling out? Is it ATAR or is it something altogether different that can talk to the whole person who's emerging as a, as a value set and a whole human? And I love what you said there around the co-design, like actually talking to students. It's one of the biggest things I always say when I'm running like professional development for teachers is like we quite often forget that our students at the end of the day are our end users. They're our target customers. They're the ones sitting inside the classroom. I remember having an instance in year 11 when I was going to be missing school for the first time for work and sending an email to my head of senior schooling saying, apologizing for taking like three or four days off school. And I remember one thing she said to me was she said, we don't work for you. We work for your parents. They pay the school fees. So they're the ones we're worried about. We don't like, you're just a student. You come, you do what you're told. And I think what I love is seeing teachers that are having those conversations with students that are taking that startup iterative cycle where it's you build, test, implement, and just keep build, test, measure, and then implement and just keep going around and around with your lesson plans because lesson plans should never stay stagnant. You shouldn't be delivering the same unit again and again and again for 10 years straight. You should be talking to your students saying, what are you liking? What aren't you liking? And how can we do better? Um, by well, having the reason they're stagnant, Scott, that's partly a policy issue. 
It's how do we start to crack away the calcification that has occurred inside curriculum. We know it has. Some states and territories and some schools, of course, have more uh, flexibility, but we need to start looking at how we start to get more agile inside our education system. And that does include, as Petra said earlier, the magic micro credentials. How do we start to get more of a pick and mix education so we've got some flexibility in its design? And then we will start to allow for the individual differences we need to see around truly personalised education delivery. And I think, oh, sorry. Jump in, Petra. <laughs> <laughs> it's my turn. <laughs> um, look, also implementing special um, projects. Currently with my uh, U10 ICT specialist group, um, we're doing a virtual reality tour of the school. So um, I put the onus back on them and they had to draft a letter to the staff who are involved in those learning areas so they can capture some video content. Um, and then the, the staff members become the client. So um, they've come up with a client brief and then they will have those conversations with the clients um, as to how they are to cater um, all of the um, recording and uh, immersive environment that they're going to create as a solution for that learning area. So even like changing the way in which, um, you know, teachers are thinking, looking for opportunities and um, sometimes you can only get that when you can see that information already being spread out in the environment. Yeah, so Petra, you're a super experienced educator and someone's asked a question here in the chat. Um, Yuko, do you have any advice on what's the best way to approach schools in a way that we get heard or, or how do teachers want to be approached? Do you have insights around how we will help or augment support, support educators so that um, they can feel more shepherded through, the, through this bridging that needs to occur? Um, like I said before, I think it's the buy-in um, and something quantitative that they can measure. So, you know, what are they going to get out of it? And then what does that look like in the long run? So if, if you spend a year with these students, um, can, can the, the school then implement the same project or the same, um, you know, the same solution uh, for further years to come or, you know, is it a, is, is a two-year project or um, how can that school then share that within the community? So part of my job also is the coordinator of a, a TDS, so which is a teacher development um, school as part of the education department in WA. Um, and, and I share my content knowledge with uh, the wider community. So engaging with schools that are maybe at the forefront um, of the innovative processes um, could be the way to kind of capture that audience, um, but also really making yourself well known. And, you know, this, this is probably a, a great example of doing so. Uh, we have a question from Karen that came through. Karen, I'm going to put you onto the panel to, to ask your question. And um, if you so choose. And Damien's asked a couple of questions as well. So after that, I might invite Damien onto the panel to ask his question as well. But um, if you want to turn your video on, um, Karen, then you can ask I might question. actually say that I do know Karen. Um, Karen does a lot of work, <laughs> sort of in the space of, um, can we, uh, how can I say, connecting um, schools with enterprise and, and certificate pathways. Was that a good? Hi. <laughs> I'm really dark. Hang on a second. Let me just put that up. Yay, there we go. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Uh, hey, can you Karen. hear me? Yeah, we've got you. Yay, so, awesome. Um, yeah, so my question, Petra, is um, actually for yourself. And what, what um, skills and development <laughs> do you think that teachers need to help to build their capacity and confidence? I'm a former teacher myself, and I know that as teachers, we take a lot of criticism and a lot of, you know, teachers need to do this and teachers need to do that. But what skills and training do they actually want to support them to have that capacity and confidence to de de um, develop these skills? Wow, that's, that's a really tough one. So I guess maybe even if, you know, if we're looking at micro credentials, do, it, do the teachers have to get those same credentials themselves in order to deliver that successfully um, or embed that successfully? So that's probably one thing that we probably need to consider. Um, look, not all teachers are um, heavily involved in um, 
wanting to probably, I'm, I'm just trying to find the nicest way to say this. Um, you know, that there, there's probably a lot of ageing demographic of teachers that may not be motivated in, in doing a lot of extracurricular activities in order to gain certification in order to deliver this stuff. So how do we actually make this um, fair and um, really sort of an easy way that teachers can learn and develop and be successful um, and use mm. the, the stuff that they've learned? Because often we do go through professional development um, and then, you know, we might um, use it for a little bit and then it kind of gets shuffled in the, the whole big stack of paperwork that's, you know, sitting on a desk somewhere. Or, you know, um, how, do we, how do we keep um, being, be, being drivers of, um, of that forward thinking approach? So, I don't know if I've answered your question and I don't know if I actually have the right answer for you. Um, but definitely, you know, um, if, if there is professional development involved, it really needs to be um, valuable and, um, and realistic and, um, and achievable also. And, and something that is going to be renewed um, and also, you know, maybe even bring in student voice, you know, ask the kids, what would you like to see from your teacher? Uh, what would you like to see from this, um, the stuff that we're learning or, you know, um, get more sort of involved in it? Hmm. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Thanks, Petra. You, you're still muted, Karen. Sorry, my son came in, so I muted it. <laughs> the, um, yeah, no, I was just interested because we're actually, um, we, we do industry connection and we also have um, an enterprise skills program that we're delivering for teachers. Ow. So um, the teachers will have um, an incubator to develop their skills. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's really what we're interested in is actually putting them through an enterprise incubator to give them real entrepreneurial skills so they can pass them on to their students. So it's just those sorts of things that we're aiming to do and whether that, that's something that teachers really want. Um, well, that's actually that something that um, Damien is uh, doing now. So Damien, I've just invited onto the panel, um, runs enterprise skills as a subject for his school. Yeah, thanks, Pete. I'm really enjoying the discussion and good to see you again and Madeline and uh, Scott as well. Um, I guess my question is almost like a flip there of the, the last question is, I guess, from a school's point of view, is there a streamlined way? I, I'm looking to get those connections with industry, um, but short of just cold calling all these businesses and saying, hey, do you want to connect and do you want to do a program with us? Um, is there a streamlined way? And I guess as an extension of that, like, you know, there are 1300 schools in Melbourne alone. Like I'm from Melbourne. Um, and if all out, if every school in Melbourne called up car sales tomorrow and said, Hey, we want to do a program with you. Like it's it just, just not viable. So yeah. Is there a, a streamline or a way to streamline this? So uh, to make it easier for schools to go the other way and connect with industry. So Damien, good to see you. I know we've had chats about this. Adam, so. Yeah. The issue of one to many, but make it meaningful. And I think um, it's how do we, not how do we make it viable, we make it virtual. I, I think that has to be the solution. I think the, the logistics and the intensivity of trying to, um, you know, get industry who at the moment, let's face it, it's a really complex time for industry in a, in a volatile yeah. workforce. Uh, I know you're running some awesome programs like your entrepreneurship program you're running this year. And, um, you know, it's getting those mentors, people who genuinely want to give back and get involved, but you're asking time of, yeah. and time's the greatest currency. And um, no, we're, where it goes into like, the concept of just how do we, with those 1300 schools, how do we stop or prevent every school or every school that's able to to door knock or cold call and find a way to collaborate and share information and I think that comes back to one thing that we've been really for, for probably 12 months we were asking people asking schools asking advisors asking employers or graduate graduate employers how do we make this easy for you and 
yes, we still do in our um, in Gold World. We still do run all pre-COVID um, running those in place in 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 the real um, work experience opportunities and programs. But I guess the last four or five months of us um, in the world that we're in at the moment, it's just galvanised the fact that we need to be thinking about how do we make things scalable, how do we make things collaborate with as many people as possible and make it as sort of um, productized or system systematized as possible. Um, and for us, it's we want to try and prevent schools from having to do all of the heavy lifting on their own because like schools, that there are so many things that schools need to be doing, like, are already burdened with, if I, if I can say that, already time for. So I guess that's a job of pot potentially like APIs like um, organisations like startups or organisations like us, like us that help bridge that gap. So it's not the burden of a school to have to go call calling a hundred different um, employers or, yeah. or pathway industry mm. pathways um, to provide for their students. How can we find ways where we actually have common resources for everybody to share? Mm -hmm. And I think Edwina, like on that as well, like also too, like looking at how can we take the content from the industry and package it up in a way that it's engaging for young people. Like I know for us, so many of our partners and clients we've looked at and they've kind of come to us saying, we have all this awesome content now, how do we get it into schools? And we look at like a program that they've developed in house and we look at it and go, yikes. Like you can tell there's some old, like there's a stale pale male in a suit, <laughs> put this together and thought, this is going to be great for kids. They're going to love it. And we just look at it and go like, no kid is going to touch that with a 10 foot pole. So yeah, because it's not user centric, it's not designed for the student and then learning is not going to land if it's not designed uh, for the human in the room. I mean, Damien, with your program that you're running this year, which is, which is awesome. And I know at the uh, genesis of that program, you know, had some really great North star thinking around what that would look like. How's yeah. the rollout going? Yeah. Um, it's been a lot of hard work, but it's been really effective. Um, but I guess I really like, uh, it has been a lot of just cold calling, connecting with people, um, you know, speaking, that's how I've met yourself and Scott and other people like that. So um, I, I guess what I'm trying to look for is an efficient way for the next school to do that rather than them, as you said, all picking up the phone and, and do, making those calls. And I guess um, I love the idea that you said earlier that, you know, having programs that businesses can just almost pick up and say, this is a, a work experience program that we can run in our school um, and if we had like a database or some way that we can go, okay, we know that A, B, C, D, E companies have access to this. Like, for example, um, through that cold calling, someone said, oh, do you know PwC does this particular thing? Um, and so I just, you know, I was able to get in contact with the right person at PwC. So it's, it was only by chance rather than being able to go to somewhere and, yeah, find it. I don't know, you know, I don't know where that somewhere is and what it looks like, but. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> Yeah, but no, yeah, it's going well. Thank you for asking it. But it has been a lot of hard work. And I guess I'm just looking for ways that, to make it easier in coming years and for, few, for other schools as well. Yeah. So, Damien, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> can I just ask a question? Um, so, what, how, have the, how have the students responded to that? So, did you put together a pr proposal to run um, this course? And d is it an elective? Did the students then choose that based on what you've got presented in a handbook or? Um, so it's a, so it's, a, it's for our year eights, it's a compulsory subject, two periods per week. Okay. Um, I've, I've come into the role to lead the program this year, but um, it's kind of been in the works for a couple of years, but this year is the first year of implementing it. Um, the connection with industry. So what we've done is the kids are working through establishing a starter. Um, and then, as I yeah, we've basically made connections with a lot of industry pe people, and each group, each group of students has a mentor. And and what I've, we've tried to do is connect a mentor that has a, I guess, is related to kind of the the startup that they're looking at. So if it's a tech startup, we're trying to connect them with a tech industry partner. Um, we have one group who are trying to solve a problem to do with homelessness, and we connect. We've worked with someone else who was also doing. Uh, a lovely lady who's, who gives free haircuts to homeless people as part of her startup. So, um, yeah, it, it, that's just, um, that's our connection. But um, we're, we're looking now to, for our year nines, like what, what's the next step? Because these year eights obviously move on and we don't want it just to be a flash in the pan, something that happened at year eight and they don't have that opportunity again. So what does it look like at year nine? And I'm re I was really looking for that, that industry connection at year nine where they could actually probably go, 
all things fingers crossed with COVID, they could actually go into workplaces and see how workplaces run and, and mm. things like that, rather than it being, at the moment, it's all like Zoom meetings and one-on-one -on -one chats and, and things like that. So, yeah. Um, and what learning area is that aligned to? Um, so we assess it against the critical and creative things, like these are disciplinary skills. Mm -hmm. um, so, and basically it's a standalone subject. So um, I head up the, the Department of Entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. so Department of Entrepreneurship. So I head up that and that subject sits within that. Um, so assessment all goes back to the interdisciplinary skills. Um, yeah. So it's not really aligned to a particular like CDT or like um, computing or mm. anything like that. Yeah. And I think that's, there's a lot of difference between that sort of style and curriculum compared to WA because we don't really have that over here. Um, okay. Yeah, which is, which is really interesting. So, um, you know, if, if you're trying to drive some of this, um, some of this way of, of critical thinking and entrepreneurialism and stuff like that, you know, then that becomes a, a little bit of a barrier because, you know, we've got our explicit curriculum um, and we don't have that wriggle room um, like to do programs like that. So then what happens to, to the schools over here um, and to the teachers over here? And then how can you get that across? Yeah, well, realistically, up until this year, it has been something that's always lived in the extracurricular, you know, lunchtime clubs, after school yeah. clubs and those kind of things. It's only, it has only been this year that we've managed to get two periods per week at year eight. Um, and not everyone's been happy about that because obviously those two periods have had to come from other subject areas. Um, but the engagement that the kids are showing, the excitement that they're showing around the subjects and then the, the skills that they're then taking into other subjects and slowly those people that maybe were a bit against it at the start are starting to realise the benefit of this subject now. Yeah. Mm, it's really intrinsically motivated. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, amazing child. Um, thank you, Damien and Karen, for jumping on the panel to ask your questions. Um, I'll temporarily kick you off the uh, panel if I can. Um, and yeah, say so thank you so much to. Uh, I want to. I want to make sure that um, Future Amp and Bob. You know, what's your call to action? What have you got coming up that you want the attendees to know about before we kind of move into the more um, breakout roomy general discussion? I'll start with you, Scott. Yeah. Um, so for us at BOP, um, I'm hoping we can pop the details in an email going out afterwards. Um, but we are giving you guys all access to our free resources for the next week. We've got a whole bunch of workbooks that we've created um, all around those 21st century skills from designing smart cities, sustainable futures, the future of work, all that sort of stuff. Um, if you use the code um, future minds, you can download all of those um, if you just head to bopeducation.com. And we also have some really awesome um, online after school programs kicking off this term that start next week um, and run throughout the term. You can book into the whole program, you can book into just one. Um, but again, you get a bit of a taste of all of our favorite programs. We have some aviation programs, some future of transport programs, smart cities, um, and everything in between. And we'd love to see you guys there. Amazing. Thank you, Scott. Um, Madwina. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be the, the Madeleine half. Um, so what we can, uh, so our platform, uh, it will be ready to rock in September. So we've got um, lots of schools already signed up. What we can offer to people who are here today is via Future Minds, um, an early adopter rate for our program. Um, so it includes virtual work experience. We've also got a suite of 12 uh, employability skills, micro-credentials, so self-paced learning online where kids can go inside industry and actually see what those skills look like. Um, and there's also workplace mentoring um, on there. So we're happy to connect via Pete or Blue Chili and we can give you um, access to a demo of the platform. Uh, so you can, teachers can try it first and understand what that looks like and develop that confidence and, and competence to uh, want to deliver that in classroom. Um, so super happy to hear from you. And you can check us out at uh, the W's future amp dot Co or reach out at hello at futureamp.co. Amazing. Thank you, Madeleine. Um, we will, feel free to post um, that info in the chat and we will follow up with um, an email uh, in the next few days just with video recording and all of this detail. Um, Petra, any call to action from yourself? Uh, get out there and inspire all students everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. 
turn that into Latin, we've got ourselves a school motto. Um, yeah. <laughs> from the Future Minds Accelerator, as I mentioned, we have some more virtual events coming up over the next two months. Uh, panel discussions, uh, some case studies, um, product demonstrations. So do sign up to the Future Minds Accelerator newsletter and we'll send all those details um, or hit us up on social media um, at Future Minds ACC. Um, thank you so much to uh, Madeline and Edwina from Futuramp, Scott from BOP and Petra um, from Hampton Senior High School. Stick around. Um, what's going to happen is um, I am going to invite all of the um, all of our audience to join the panel and we'll just have a kind of an after the panel um, chat. I know there are a few questions. So one from Eddie, one from um, Damien Holtz that, um, you know, I'd love you to ask. So um, thank you again for joining us. And uh, this is the end of the formalities. And over the next 30 seconds, I'll invite everyone to join us on the panel. Uh, feel free to leave your camera off if you uh, don't want your camera on. Uh, feel free just to be an observer, but um, equally feel free to, to jump up and ask questions. So, um, Damien Holes, um, you had a question. I'll let you, um, when you're ready, turn on your microphone and your camera and um, ask your question. Cool, thanks, off, Pete. Uh, I should have apologised, actually. I'm sitting on the couch in my, pretty much in my pyjamas here, so I probably should leave my camera off. Um, no worries. Sorry, that, sorry Damien, uh, there was a question from another Damien. Who, oh, sorry. That's all right. Yeah, hi, everyone. Great, um, great inspiring discussion around education here. I've, um, I've lost the actual wording of my question as we converted to the uh, new way, but it, it was around, um, I guess, what the what do you all think the low hanging fruit is from both school side and also a corporate side of, you know, what what needs to change in terms of equipping students with the skills that they're really going to need for the future in this ever changing fast environment. So, you know, governments obviously got other things to focus on right now, we can't rely on them. And uh, we really need to keep pushing this for students. So what do you all think? The, the low hanging fruit is? I don't know if the tree bore fruit this year, but, um, <laughs> but um, it's a great question, Damien. And look, it's a complex thing. I, I think we talked earlier about siloing of, of education and industry, how do we start to connect? We know, we know the Gonski report in 2018 was really talking about how we create more pipelines. And I think it's really starting to think differently about what is the role of education in the world that we're in right now? And when we think about that, it is about finding a pathway for every student. And so if we think about it as, as lifelong learning as a whole pathway and not a closed system that stops at the tunnel of year 12 or whichever year the students are opting out, then we're going to open out our thinking around how we design that system. And we design it across the term of someone's life as they emerge into a, a really dynamic, gig-based workforce. Uh, where they are going to have up to 17 jobs across five different industries. That's all that uh, research, you know, is talking to that. And so let's start to think more holistically around what a whole human looks like emerging into a whole kind of pathway. Yeah. And I think as well on that, it's looking at showing students how the skills they learn in certain subject areas can be applied in other subject areas. Like I think something as simple as like, if you learn how to use the Adobe suite in your media class, saying that, hey, that like you can use those skills outside of your media, media classroom. You can use them in English and you can use them in science and has. And I think showing students how the skills, like again, like it's not, their skills aren't siloed as well. Like your English skills don't leap, don't stop the moment you walk out of the English classroom that you can actually apply those skills to so many different areas with that cross-curricular learning. Yeah, and breaking down the classroom walls as well. That's right. And this fluidity and this dynamism that we see in the workforce and the real lived experience. Um, and so, yeah, finding those applications so it brings the learning to life. As yeah. well, even if, if you, even if you can't reach out and connect to industry right this moment, thinking about we've, we've met with lots of really incredible schools that are simulating real world problems in classrooms. So uh, sometimes we don't need industry in the classroom with the amount of information and content available for, for everybody at the moment. It's sometimes about bringing that real information into the classroom and using that as the kind of centerpiece for problem solving. It's still real world. And yes, maybe there's no actual real world. It's not solving the real world problem, but even simulating those kind of 
real complex wicked problems and making students aware of them and also comfortable with managing um, solution of problems that don't have a clear cut, cut solution. Like we think about how many startups and businesses that are born of solving really great problems and like just bring these many kind of problems and simulated problems into classrooms also as a kind of way to kind of avoid having to cold call a hundred different industries um, to get their problems into opportunities in classrooms. And I think teachers um, uh, are just trying to keep honest and true to the curriculum. So they're only doing the, the expected um, requirements of them. So, you know, they may not be actually looking for those extra opportunities to embed, you know, something like the global goals um, into into their curriculum, so it really it challenges um, the students as well as giving them opportunities of like design thinking, uh, rapid application development, um, and and stuff like that. So um, it, it's it's interesting because you know if teachers are um, delivering content in a certain way, um, and therefore their expectations are also um, you know a certain way as well, then what is actually happening in at university level like um, you know how are these teachers being taught to be teachers and and what other uh, external factors are they pulling on in order to um, you know embed entrepreneurialism and design thinking and all those um, 21st century soft skills that unfortunately kids now need going into the future you were actually talking to a, um, quite a progressive school this, just this morning that quite, had quite an interesting take on upskilling teachers and that was providing teachers who may have been career teachers and not had a job outside of education and providing them with an opportunity to upskill and immerse in a different workplace that isn't education and providing kind of permission. I know it's really hard for a lot of schools to get time out of the classroom and out of schools, but rethinking what um, professional professional development looks like and maybe it is teachers not being in the classroom or not doing kind of education CBD all the time but putting teachers into real workplaces and giving teachers the opportunity to immerse and learn and observe and even start developing and cultivating these these skills that we talk about but actually seeing them in practice mm. being a really powerful learning experience for a teacher. That answered your question, Damien. Thank, thanks, everyone. That's very, very inspiring. <laughs> What's your background, Damien? Uh, so I work in corporate innovation, uh, but I'm, I've got a dream where I really want to start my own progressive alternative school in Sydney. So that's sort of my side hustle uh, moonlight job at the moment. It's my passion project. So, yeah, I find it fascinating, all of the pain points and challenges, you know, around curriculum and government and just the fact that education in Australia, we're slipping behind other countries. So yeah, it's trying to find ways to refresh that and, you know, break down the barriers. And I think I saw you connect with Eddie in the chat. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have a lot to talk about. Yeah, totally. Uh, and Damien, and I've worked inside corporate innovation as a consultant and in-house at Telstra and, and other big companies. Uh, and we, you know, often you talk about the horizons of innovation or disruptive innovation. And I think what we're talking about is not disruptive innovation. We're talking about trying to bring everybody with us because designing an alternative universe I think, you know, what we need to do and what Petra's saying is we, the, the system is there. We've got some incredible teachers, some great educators. We need to try and, you know, get some agility into the system and then innovate from within and, and bring the system with us. Um, that, that's, you know, it's iterative, I think, is what we're, we're trying to do. Yeah, and even like with disruptive technologies and bringing that sort of stuff into the classroom, um, it, it's not it's not just about oh let let's quickly just use a drone or or here's some VR equipment and and we are um, having an immersive experience and this is really great, but it's actually like developing the technology further and and using it for a, a, a purpose um, and really challenging the students to really think. Uh, outside the box with that equipment um, and and how they can look to um, you know look to the future and and invent really um, some amazing solutions and products or you know try and solve some real world problems out there 
Um, and I think that that's a big issue because, you know, we're so used to just either using or teaching how to use that technology, but not really the thinking and the application of it. Exactly, and proving that it has a right to exist because there is a use case that is anchored in the real world. It's actually solving real human problems. Mm. It's like, like digital literacy versus digital confidence. Like we always talk about making sure our kids are digitally literate, but that's just they can follow steps and get an end result. But that whole, what you guys are talking about is digital confidence, the ability to follow those steps, learn about it, but then be confident enough to try things, to fail, to experiment, to test and to break it. And I think that's really where we have to get our kids to. It's not just, I can go from step one to step 10 and get that output. It's taking it that one step further because that's how they're going to apply it in the real world. Um, just a bit of Zoom etiquette. Uh, I know a lot of people have their cameras off. So if you want to speak, we can't see the body language, but if you unmute, we can see that you've, you've unmuted. That's a, an indicator that you want to speak. So um, feel free to do that. I don't feel the pressure to turn your camera on. But Eddie, I know you had a question. I'm dying to ask this now, given the last, the last conversation as well. Um, and I, Scott, I love your three R's compared to reading, writing and arithmetic. You're real relevant and relatable. And I'm just wondering, given all the discussion and where it's gone, do the panel think that numeracy and literacy need to be redefined for the 21st century? And what we're trying to teach at the moment is like a 19th century version of maths and English. Um, and if so, how would you change them? I actually heard a really cool, I had a conversation last week with this amazing educator on that topic exactly, Eddie, actually. Um, they were talking about English and teaching, how can you teach English in a different way that's more engaging to kids? And the example they used was teaching um, Macbeth. So Shakespeare, it's always taught and kids kind of like roll their eyes and go, okay, here we go. And it's always about teaching the language and the rhythm and like how the actual like text and how it's written. But what this English teacher did with his students is he was teaching Macbeth and they were talking about the social issues you can learn from Macbeth. They were, they read it and they said, well, what do you think? Like, do you think that Macbeth is a good king? Do you think that Lady Macbeth is a good wife? And what makes a good wife and what makes a good king and talks a lot about those social issues of what actually makes a good person. And it was fascinating because they got to have the most phenomenal conversations with their students, getting all the students to really buy in. But again, relating it to stuff that they know about, like, getting them to actively say, what do they think a good human is? And what do you think a bad human is? And what do you think those traits are? And he said, funnily enough, when it came to their exam and their assessment where they were doing it, when they were doing their exam and assessment on the regular curriculum, just because the students were so invested in the topic and it was relevant and it was relatable to them, they did, they outperformed any other year level that teacher had ever had. Um, so I think it's again, yeah, looking at how can we make literacy and numeracy more relevant and to like Eddie, um, sorry, to Maddie, Madeline and Edwina's point um, and to Petra's point as well. It's looking at, yeah, like what, how can we build the whole student? It's not just about their building a good academic. It's about building a good human. A hundred percent agree with all of that, Scott. And I think coming into edu into ed tech and education from a non-education background, we've talked about it so much about why do we send kids to school for 13 years what is the purpose of school what is the purpose of an education and what does what are we trying to achieve with 13 years of education with the system that we've got at the moment and we think that like as mad said before is that everybody should have a pathway after they finish school or even when they're at school so why, why do we educate people? We educate people to be, as you said, Scott, like we educate people to be hopefully good citizens, good people in our communities, good husbands, wives, friends, workers, but also finding like we're only on the planet for, we, we don't know how long we're on the planet for and how do we, we're so fortunate in the time that we live in the moment that we have so much opportunity and so many different pathways that it's just that we've got a glut of, options and it's overwhelming so at what, what point and our role our role in supporting schools is in that kind of um, career education space which is an area which is kind of being forgotten it's usually a career advisor that works a few days a week that's basically in a broom cupboard in a school that's lost and forgotten and really not very well supported but thinking about if school is helping people find a pathway a meaningful pathway and being a good human well, how are we bringing that into the curriculum? How are we bringing that into a, a really core component of why we send kids to school for 13 years? Because so many people 
and this is something I'm personally really passionate about, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s still don't know what they want to be when they grow up because we haven't programmed or, or helped them start thinking about that from a very early age. We haven't given them students the skills, the mindsets, and the ability to kind of find their path. And they might not, people might not have just one path, people, people may have many paths. But I think in all of these conversations, like underpinning everything is what's the purpose of school? What's the purpose of education? Why do we do what we do? And I think a lot of the time we don't really know why we do what we do. And so I'm in cynic, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So as educators and people working in this space, I think we need to think a bit more about the why. I think just going back to um, the emphasis on numeracy and literacy, um, especially with NAPLAN and now that NAPLAN has been sort of suspended and, and we've had to look at a different model and now we're doing older. Um, and for those, oh, I'm assuming everyone knows, which is the online numeracy and literacy assessment is that, um, you know, you, we are seeing a little bit of a shift um, in that space, but, you know, um, yes, we could teach um, literacy and, and stu by the end of year 12, hopefully, students are going to be literate um, and therefore they can get their secondary graduation. But I think there needs to be some sort of reflection and refining as to what that looks like, um, because, you know, there, there are students that do have, um, they might have something like dyslexia um, and they've just gone through school um, and they've still been successful. Um, whether or not they, you know, that's a measurement of, um, you know, if, if they are literate or they're not literate, um, you know, they can still be successful. And hey, I use Grammarly all the time. So, you know, what does that, what actually um, is the purpose for, students to be deemed literate um, and and do we need to refine that and and look at different ways in which we measure that um, and look you know I am all for the standardized testing um, because I think that you know that is a skill within itself you know students have to go for a driving lesson and and this is why we do tests so you know there's a bit of trans um, is transferable um, but yeah I, I think there needs to be a little bit of a change and a, and a different focus um, and what the what 21st century skills look like and a, a, what does what do they want as an outcome um, in terms of literacy and numeracy and I know like numeracy I think everyone really needs that um, but you know how much emphasis is being put on that and also you know what what do the kids get to take away from that you know not everyone's going to be working in that space yeah, well, maybe that looks like anchoring to real world. And that's what we keep coming back to is maybe, you know, mass literacy looks like understanding what compound interest is, you know, or what getting a bank account looks like and saving and planning. And maybe English, you know, literacy looks like, as Pete put in the chat, Hamilton. Let's watch, you know, let's watch Hamilton. And what's the story in that? And how do we connect with the characters? And what's, how's the language affecting us? How do we start to... Um, you know, make education relevant and connect with the, the humans who are at the centre of it. And I think, look at the School of Life, the incredible work that Alanda Breton and other people like that have done, the philosophers, you know, the people who have connect, who've brought language, you know, across the ages and brought it up and then made it relevant in terms of the way that we connect with each other as humans. And I think it's about humanising education. We are not a factory industrial model anymore. That's not what humans on the earth to do. We're here to connect and get through the challenging times that we're facing um, and, and that's what it is about um, finding some way to make it relevant. And I think that's what I found is the really interesting thing like a lot of my friends now are 20 years old like we're second third well should be second third year uni and like a lot of my friends were those high performing kids like great academics they were like top of the class like and it was interesting because they're always the ones that in year 11 and 12 everyone looked at and like they were like wow they've got their life together they're just they're gonna soar as soon as they graduate and the funny thing is is they're the ones that have crumbled the most as soon as they got out of school like they're the ones that their first year of university was a total mess they were changing subjects every single semester they are still now like going, I don't actually know what I want to do. I don't know how to adult. I don't know what subjects I like. Like I'm studying psychology because my English teacher told me I should study psychology, but I don't like psychology. Um, and I think that's the really interesting thing is, yeah, just because you're a great, great academic, just because you do really well in school in the current system doesn't mean you're going to be a good adult. Like doesn't mean you're going to be a functioning human being. 
Um, and I think that's where we're like, that's where I've seen firsthand the real gaps in the system where these kids that I went to school with that I was like, they've just, they've got their life together. They're going to be the ones that saw it in adulthood are the ones that have crumbled the most. And it shows that the education system has really failed them. Yeah. And the real world is in the front when, once they get out to it, because they pop out of the walls of, of the education system. We should have a class on how do you survive a breakup? What happens if your parents <laughs> break up? Seriously. You know, how do you, yeah. how do you deal when you fail, when you don't achieve something? Life That's skills, right human skills. That's what I found there. Like I was, so I was one of those high performing kids in year 11, year 12. I got to the point I was missing five weeks of school every term, just traveling around the world for these different events. And because of that, like I dropped from math advanced down to core math. I dropped from like English advanced down to basic English. And that's exactly what we did. Like advanced math, we're looking at calculating the parabola of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which is great. But then I dropped down to core math and I did an assignment on credit cards. I had three different credit cards and three different people with spending habits and I had to pair them together. I did another assignment on renovation. Someone was redoing their garden. I had to calculate the area and perimeter and how much soil they were going to need. I did another assignment on mortgage, like mortgages and what home loans were the best. And I was like, so I've spent my entire schooling career calculating parabolas of Sydney Harbour Bridges and all that sort of stuff. And then in my final year, that's when I, it's when I dropped to the dumb math and I like all of my friends, I was patronized for it as one of like the dumb kids doing basic math and basic English. But I was sitting there being like, this is much easier than the stuff I was doing. And it's stuff that I actually use now. Like it frustrates me that there's that, that's a, that elitism of like, oh, I'm going to university. I'm doing the advanced mathematics. I'm doing the hardest subjects. So I'm better than you all. But really it's those basic subjects that are teaching the kids the most real world adult skills. I don't know. Uh, it looks like uh, I suspect you were coming up to five to nine. People are going to start dropping off soon. One thing I love to do um, finishing these sessions is I'd love everyone just to put into the chat one thing you learned tonight that you didn't know before um, the session and or one thing you're going to do as a result of this session. Um, love you. Just invite you to pop that into the chat so the panelists can see the impact that they've made. I'm not kicking you out just yet. I just got the feeling from a couple of comments that people are starting to think about leaving. So I wanted to get this in before we finish. This is how I finish my classes as well as a way of making sure people learn something. Pete, this is where we need some elevator music. Yeah. We've that game show music when we're coming in now. It seems like do, do, all the thinking music on the game shows. <laughs> say the price of my love is not a price that you're willing to pay you cry in your tea which you hurl in the sea when you see me go by why so sad remember we made an arrangement when you went away now you're making me mad remember despite our estrangement I'm your man You'll be back <laughs> Soon you'll see You'll remember you belong to me You'll be back Time will tell You'll remember that I served you well Oceans rise Empires fall We have seen each other through it all And when push comes to shove I will send a fully armed battalion to remind you of my love da 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 I'm such a musical theatre nerd. I loved every second of that. <laughs> it was like all of my year 12 was just blasting that in the school music rooms. Amazing. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, if you do need to drop off, feel free to drop off. Uh, I get that it's a school night. Um, thank you again to our panelists. Thank you for joining us. I'm not kicking you out, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having us. It's been a great discussion. And if anyone would like to reach out, we love getting feedback and hearing from other people so we can better design 
products that are going to suit your needs. So please reach out at hello at futureamp.co. And same with me as well. Always happy to jump on a virtual coffee or a physical coffee if you're in Brisbane, although maybe not physical for much longer if this COVID wave keeps ticking up. Um, you know, flick me an email. Um, if you just go to any of the contact forms on uh, the BOP website, always happy to help. Um, yes, Deborah, we will share a recording of this um, for yourself and feel free to pass it around to anyone else who might be interested. Um, I'll just add my Twitter handle in the chat. So feel free to connect and also on LinkedIn, which I think Damien's already just done. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Petra.